This is the first of a two-part series, so the second half of this will be tomorrow, because it was kind of long, so we wanted to break it up for you. And most of you guys probably know who Doug Bear is, so with no further ado, I will let Doug take over. All right, good afternoon, everybody. I hope everybody is finding themselves well today. Um, getting ready to uh, roll out and introduce to you our brand new, uh, exciting residential condensing product and heat pump product. Um, I believe today, now this is the first time we've done this, so I believe today we're going to make it through product introduction, installation process with some highlights and component overview. Uh, that will save tomorrow. We'll get into the actual servicing and support uh, with both the uh, app, the carrier app, which we'll talk about, and then the actual hands-on uh, component uh, type troubleshooting and service. So let's see okay well we're starting out uh getting stuck here hold on uh if you have your mouth you might have to click on this powerpoint slides and then you should be able to use yeah. the arrows that's what i'm doing hang on here oh then just hit your computer really hard on the side yeah that's what i just did it worked <laughs> perfect <laughs> just like my old tv when i grew up as a kid there we go all right so let's get into the product introduction first here and talk about the new 2624 or 26 sear heat pump and 24 sear on the air conditioner both bryant and carrier all right this is going to be our top tier so what this is going to do is replace our 25 vna zeros on the uh carrier side and on the bryant side of the fence it'll replace the uh amv 280s so we'll give you some more model numbers in just a second as we go through here but this is will be our top tier this will be replacing the 25 vna zero and the uh, bryant 280 and 180 for that matter so again up to 26 sear um, 13 eer in the five ton model and we'll get into all the detail on this uh, as we go through the slides um, operation uh these things are just like the uh vna zeros and the 280s uh extremely quiet inverter driven compressors uh ecm motors on the condenser fan so uh sound level is actually just possibly slightly under what the vna zeros were and your uh, bryant 280s so wider operating range we'll get into details on all these so these are just kind of your bullet points here so Enhanced dehumidification mode, still functional on both. And long line set link. So this should be an exciting point. Um, as we were talking about our five speeds, as you guys know, we were stuck at 100 feet of interconnected refrigerant piping. Uh, we're gonna get out a lot longer now. We'll get closer to 200 feet with these. So that's a big plus. Um, over the air software updates, we'll get into a lot of detail on that tomorrow. These are gonna, you're gonna find out we've got a, a basically a Bluetooth receiver board on the outdoor unit um, that we can talk to the unit directly uh, through the uh, carrier app on your phones. So that's uh, one of the biggest exciting, uh, most exciting uh, enhancements to this product. I think you'll like. So um, <clears throat> again, service tech app, we'll talk about that tomorrow, uh, get into more detail. Uh, what that's about and how to use it, uh, show you how to get it downloaded, uh, all that good stuff. So, as far as the footprint, um, the VNA zeros, the 280s, the ANV 280s, the footprint's going to remain the same, so no increase in size. Um, so, also good news. So, a lot of a lot of semi-new stuff and uh, uh, a lot of uh, similarities to what the uh, previous product is. Now, um, we've already had a couple of questions prior to starting this uh, program today is, let's just get this out of the way. When is this going to be released? When is it going to be available for purchase? And we're probably looking at somewhere um, early to mid-summer, so in the June, possibly early July time frame. So we've still got to get product in. Uh, we've still got to move the uh, VNA zeros and the, the A and V 280s, the 180s. We need to get those moved out of inventory first before these are going to be released. So as we move those out, we start receiving inventory of these in. Um, probably going to put us in the uh, June time frame. Uh, don't 
foresee anything longer than that, but with everything else going on right now, uh, we could have a couple weeks delay. So that's where we're at on that, okay? So enhanced operating range, what does that mean? Well, if you're in the 25 series, um, heat pumps are gonna go down to minus 15 now. And AC wise, which really doesn't, great, you know, really doesn't affect the greater uh, Chicago TEC market, but uh, we can go up to 125 degrees uh, outdoor ambient temperatures. So a little bit extended uh, on the operating ranges. Well, actual nomenclature for these. On the carrier side, AC only will be the 24 VNA6. And then on the heat pump side, 25 VNA4. Right, and these will take over, as I mentioned earlier, your VNA, your 25 VNA zeros. So those become phased out. Now on the um, Bryant side, on the AC, the 186 C and V, and for the heat pump, the 284 A and V, which is gonna take over the 180s, and then the 280 A and B products as they phase out here towards, like I say, probably mid-summer, early to mid-summer. That's what the projection game plan is. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, larger look at the model list, as you can see here, we're going to have an offering from the uh, 24 sizes we did before, the three ton, the four ton, and the five ton, both in the AC and the heat pump, and the same with the Bryant, 24, three ton, four and five on the cooling side and heat pump side, same thing, 24, 36, and uh, 48, 60,000 BTU units. So. And of course, you can see um, some of the new SKUs here and what families are related to here. So um, pretty easy changeover as far as nomenclature goes. Um, pretty easy to track. Come on here. Having problems. I think my battery is going on my mouse here. Let me change something. All right, we'll just get rid of that. So anyway, that was kind of the products we're dealing with here, product introductions. So now let's start talking about some of the installation uh, process on this. Now, the products that we just mentioned, AC and heat pump on both carrier and the Bryant side, these have to operate with an Infinity or Evolution Connect system. So you have to have a communicating indoor furnace or the FE fan coils. Um, you have to have the Infinity again or Evolution Connects uh, controller. Uh, just no way to operate this without, okay? So one of the first things that we're gonna recommend you do is before we start the installation of the condensing unit or the heat pump is you should update the indoor wall controller with software and also make sure that you have a Series B wall controller. It's gotta be a Series B wall controller. Uh, we can't go backwards on that prior to Series B, and then all Series Bs uh, will be capable of updating the software. So the first step in installation is we want to make sure that our Series B Infinity or Evolution controller uh, gets a software update to version 3.0. So currently 3.0 is the software version we need to operate this on, okay? Now, if you check today, you're gonna to find out 3.0 isn't available. That's gonna be coming down in about, uh, well, we're talking a couple, two or three weeks here before that's available. So that software uh, download will be available um, by June when this product becomes available for sale, okay? So that's gonna be your first step when you go out to a site. Now, two ways of updating to version three. One, we can either use the SD card um, lagging behind here. We can use the micro SD card to update it if the homeowner currently does not have their controller connected to a Wi-Fi uh, service. So believe it or not, there are a lot of units out there that are not connected to Wi-Fi service yet or wired service. So um, either way, if you have wired or wireless service to your controller, you can do just a standard update on software. If not, then you want to use the micro SD card 
to update this to 3.0. And as we go on, this will make sense why we're doing this. But the first thing you really wanna do is get this out of the way. You don't wanna go through the whole installation practice outside, putting the unit in, piping it all in, only to come indoors and say, oh no, we don't have a Series B controller and I'm having difficulty updating software. So you know, let's take care of this indoor piece uh, of the install first, okay? Um, doing a software update, with the uh, micro SD card, if you do that, um, this thing is, you probably are aware, if not, uh, these SD cards insert from the bottom. When you do put these in, make sure you hear them snap in place. You should hear a little click as you push this in firmly. So um, if you don't, um, you may get, um, you may get some alarm or fault codes on there saying that it can't read the card or doesn't see a card present. So, Anyway, once you uh, insert your SD card, then you simply go to update software using the micro SD card, or if they have Wi-Fi available and it's connected and all set up already, then you can simply go right here, update software using Wi-Fi. So either way, either one you select, that's gonna be your first step. <clears throat> then you go to the system control software update, insert the card, and then update software using the micro SD card. And again, if the system is already connected to Wi-Fi, we don't have to do the micro SD card. We can just simply uh, do it through the Wi-Fi setup. So either way, that's the first thing we wanna do is make sure we get version 3.0 software into the user controller, okay? And then, of course, if everything's working right, um, you'll get this type of screen. And do you want to update software? Of course, you're going to uh, select yes. And then you should get this screen where you're actually uh, uploading the software upgrade. And again, the same screen you'll get regardless if you're doing it via Wi-Fi um, or if you're using the uh, micro SD card. So once that's done, then you should get this screen telling you that the software was successfully upgraded. And as you can see here to 3.0. And once you get that screen, you click done. And now we are all set uh, inside with the uh, controller. And then we can remove the SD card. And then we move on to the outdoor installation. So again, uh, we're recommending that you take care of that part of the installation first. Um, you know, let's make sure they have the right uh, user interface inside. Let's make sure that it accepts the software update. Um, let's get all that out of the way first, and then we'll come back to that later on uh, throughout the installation procedure, okay? So <clears throat> moving on to the rest of the installation with the outdoor unit, uh, piping and evaporator. You know, the evaporator coils, there's no change there. The piping, it's going to be the same thing. Um, you know, you've got the liquid line, the suction line. The reason I point that out is we're going to see some, a different component now on the five ton unit. And uh, it's called a subcooler, braze plate heat exchanger subcooler on the five ton. I'll explain more about that as we go on. Um, but We've had uh, questions or inquiries that how do you pipe something like that? Well, you, you don't, it's all an internal component to the outdoor unit. So the installation, as far as again, piping the evaporator coil, connecting your piping to the condensing unit or heat pump to the evaporator, everything is the same as it's been before. There aren't any changes, nothing special with piping, um, just, you know, ACR piping. Uh, brazing using a uh, nitrogen purge. We'll get to that in a couple of slides. And then of course, everything you see here uh, from a safety aspect, you know, and looking if you're not real familiar with it, review the safety information that's in the install book, you know, check your local codes, um, use electrical lockout tags, and of course, proper personal protection. And then if you're not, you know, what you won't be familiar with this unit, because it's brand new, always look at the installation instructions for additional safety and installation tips and points. You know, it's always good to review these books if you haven't done one of the units yet, regardless of what it is. If it's a furnace, heat pump, AC, whatever, always review the install books to see if there's any, you know, special procedures you need to look at. So 
So of course the new packaging is a you know is out now. So these will come in the new packaging. I'm assuming most of you have experienced this so far. Um, this is the new style packaging we're using with these clips. So to remove these, to remove the top, you simply squeeze the clips together, you pull the tab up, and then you rotate it down and then remove the tab. And these are all reusable, they can be reinserted. So if you take the top off for whatever reason, you can put it back on, you can reuse the box, uh, whatever you wanna do, but that's how you get in there. You don't need any um, knives or anything to, Stanley knives, get the box open, pop the top off, you got the same tabs down at the bottom, two on this side, two on the opposite side, and this lifts right off. So it's kind of a neat design. It works pretty well. I've, I've, I've looked at several of them now. I've watched several people take them apart. And it's pretty quick, and it's nice to be able to put it back together if necessary. So it's about as exciting as I can get on a package or a box, okay? All right, so... <clears throat> As far as uh, matchup and compatibility, uh, again, the evaporator coils, you know, you'll have an ARI rated combination for the evaporator coils, which isn't gonna be any different than what you're doing today with the VNA zeros or the uh, 180s or 280s on the Bryant side. But again, the indoor unit has to be a communicating style indoor unit. So if you're doing fan coil, then it's gotta be the FE and it's gotta be a communicating furnace. So it's got to be Infinity Evolution compatible. If not, you simply can't use this. Um, you're, you're looking at the wrong piece of equipment. So control-wise, it just won't function. So it's got to be, again, communicating indoor unit um, and the Infinity Connects controller. We're going to talk about liquid line filter dryers here and their locations. So we're going to see that the filter dryer, as other units, comes shipped with the outdoor unit, and it's also going to be shipped with that five-inch liquid stub-out tube, as we used to do. Okay, so you're going to get that tube again, and I'm going to talk about the location of the filter dryer uh, here in a second. Um, and again, just to cover the bases, you know, we have to quench the dryer, we need to quench the service valves outside, liquid and suction, they've got to be quenched uh, with wet cloths. We do have nylon gasketing inside those service valves, so we don't want to get excessive heat on those service valves, or you're going to melt those nyl nylon gasketing, and then we're going to end up with uh, service valve leaks. And then, of course, we want to also uh, protect the filter dryer when brazing that in place. Now, filter dryer location. On the two, three, and four ton units, you know, we ideally recommend putting the liquid line filter dryer close to the evaporator. That way, that's going to catch any kind of breeze connections we have upstream of it. And, you know, use that five inch stub that comes with the filter dryer right here. So you'll sweat that onto the stub out going to the TXV filter dryer and your liquid line back to the condensing unit. Now on the two, three, and four ton units, you can put the filter dryer inside here, or you can put the filter dryer, if you want, outside by the heat pump or the condensing unit. The five ton unit is different. The five ton unit location for the liquid line filter dryer is gonna be that five inch stub going right to the liquid service valve and then the filter dryer. The reason this filter dryer needs to be outdoors on the five ton unit is because of the subcooler, the braze plate heat exchanger we'll talk about in later slides. So not only does this act as the filter dryer, it's going to act as a muffler on the liquid line. Now these units aren't loud. There's no difference in sound operation, operating sound uh, from this or the two, three and four ton unit, but it is possible through the braze plate heat exchanger before the liquid exits the unit and then through the service valve into the liquid line, it is possible to get some sound attenuation through the refrigerant. And that's why we want the filter dryer out here five inches away from the service valve um, on the five ton. So five ton uh, service valve has a dedicated spot 
two, three, and four ton. You can have it down here by the coil. You can have it outside like the five ton, doesn't matter. Okay, so that's what that's all about uh, when you see that in the installation book. Okay, any questions on that? Ryan, you seen any questions on that? We do have we had two questions one was jasper asking about some of the restrictions on the vertical height limitations i told him you probably okay. cover that in a little bit yes um the other one was just right uh, now two minutes ago from from john can the outdoor unit still use only two wires to communicate with the system um yes and i'll cover that again later but yes this is the same thing we can use uh your just your a and b uh connections for communication to the outdoor unit as long as the outdoor unit has a proper ground. Uh, what we get into trouble with on our other units that we use just two wire communication with, the two speeds or the five speeds, if there's improper ground outdoors, you can get some communication errors on it. And then you, you either have to correct that ground issue or put a ground rod into the ground, one of the three foot stakes, aluminum stakes into the ground and then chassis ground the unit from that point. This is the same exact thing. So just A and B only is required unless you have grounding issues with the unit. And I always tell guys too on the stack classes, if you're pulling new wire anyway, if it's a new construction or something like that, just pull five wire and be done with the discussion. Um, but if it's existing, that's when you try to make the two wires work because right. you're there. Yep. Uh, yep. We did have two other questions come in while we were just chatting. One's from Jim. Uh, he asks, can it be installed further out from the condenser? Maybe the liquid line filter dryer on I'm, the five. I think he's. I think he typed that at the time you were saying that, but it doesn't say that specifically. Yeah, um, on the five ton unit, we want it. We want that five inch distance. Uh, we want that to stay here. So see my cursor right here. There's a five inch tube that comes shipped with the filter dryer. We want that five inches from the unit. So no, we don't want to put that anywhere else. It needs to be right there for proper. Uh, attenuation of the sound in the liquid line. Now, on the two through four ton units, yes, you can put that anywhere from down here by the coil, no closer than five inches to the coil, and then anywhere else in the liquid line that works for you. But the five ton is different. And when I say, when we get to that braze plate heat exchanger, and I'll show you the refrigeration cycle of it, then it'll make a little bit more sense. All right, uh, I'm gonna read Joe's question, but I think you just answered it also. He's asking if that five inch piece can be bent to a 90 degree angle. Yes. Yes. If you need to bend that, you can bend it. I was going to guess you were going to say no. I thought I assumed it needed to be five straight coming in there. Okay. I'm glad I asked this question then. Now it's it's the distance that they tested the filter dryer location in, so you, you can you can bend up to a ninety on it. All right. Several people asked that same question. All right. Uh, one more, and then we'll let you get back to it. Adrian asks uh, if it's UV safe. I'm assuming if the plastic coating on the out the paint is UV resistant. I'm assuming he's asking. Uh, yeah, on the unit, it's the same. It's the same epoxy paint we've used on all of them. So, you know, it's, you know, paint, regardless of what kind of epoxy paint it is or, you know, what what have you, eventually everything is going to break down from UV uh, when it comes to coatings, plastics, paints, and things like that. But, yes, it is uh, UV-resistant paint. Um, grills are as well. Um, you know, your plastic cap on the top that's, you know, either showing the Bryant Crest or the Carrier Oval, you know, but over time you will see some wear on it. Um, you know, condensing units, uh, I, I'm one of those weirdos that I, I do wash and, you know, every year or two I'll, I'll put a coat of wax on my condensing unit. You know, it's, I, you know, you take care of it that way and it lasts like a car. But as you know, even car paint eventually will change color slightly. So. Um, there, there's the long version of the answer, I think. So, um, I think we're all caught up on questions, Doug. Okay, and then I, I will address the, um, as we go on further, I'll address again your vertical separations. But basically on these units, if you have a vertical separation, and this is if the condensing unit is above or below, if you're at 20 foot, um, you, you need to add a liquid line solenoid valve, which will give get more detail there. Um, if the uh, evaporator is above the condenser, you're going to be at 20 feet, uh, and that's as far as you want to go. 
and below. Um, I'm still waiting to hear exactly what we're doing below. Uh, currently, all the service literature on this hasn't been released yet. They're still going through review. So I don't have that exact vertical separation number for you yet uh, that this has been tested at uh, with the evaporator below the condensing unit. But what I can tell you for sure is if you're at the 20 foot mark, regardless of elevation differences, uh, you will need liquid line solenoid valve. We'll cover that again on some slides going forward. All right. So <clears throat> as far as location for the unit outdoors, it's just all the common practices you've used on any other unit. So, you know, keep in mind dryer vents, um, you know, areas that have got, um, you know, a lot of uh, collection area for leaves, things like that, um, exhaust um, from your furnaces, from the 90% furnaces, water heaters. Um, just think about all those things. Of course, we always want it on a solid level mounting pad. Um, heat pumps, they need to be elevated. Well, how high? Well, the answer to that is, uh, you know, above expected snow depth. That's always been the answer to that. Well, now, that question is something other that's out there for interpretation. What is the expected snow depth? Well, we don't know, especially in the Midwest. I mean, it could be a year like this year in the Chicago market, um, you, you know, or we could have three, four, five feet of snow. So just think about the location. Is it an area, and the, and the homeowner typically can assist you with this. Is it an area that typically has snow drifts? Um, you know, is it a buildup of, uh, you know, in corners and things with leaves, snow, what have you. So, uh, the same thing goes for this. This isn't any different than any other heat pump or any other condensing unit when it comes to that type of deal, locations and elevations for our snow in our areas. Okay. Um, there are minimum clearances, um, typically 12 inches on each side. Uh, most of the time we can handle, uh, we can handle that. Uh, because typically three sides are exposed. Um, if you have a 12 inch side clearance and you have two units next to each other, it's not 12 inches between each unit, it's 12 inches per each unit. So if you have two units next to each other and your clearance is 12 inches, these should actually be 24 inches apart. Okay, so always follow your clearance requirements, which are in your installation manuals with pictures and numbers and all that good stuff, okay? Then operating ambient temperatures, again, the TEC marketplaces are around the country that we have, um, you know, in the Wisconsin's to Illinois, Michigan, Indiana, um, we're not gonna see this 125 degree max cooling mode operation. You know, the best we see around here is maybe 100, 105 sometimes, but nothing higher than that typically. Um, now, heating is something different. Max outdoor temperature for operating the heat pump in the heating mode is 66 degrees, which is pretty typical of uh, air-cooled heat pumps. So that's uh, real new news here. And again, heating, uh, heating mode and heat pumps, we can operate this down to minus 15 um, degrees. So, uh, but checking your ambient temperatures, um, Really, as far as outdoor ambient temperatures go, um, we're well within these ranges. Um, but what you have to be careful with when we look at the high side for condensing operating temperatures is installing these units in an enclosure within buildings, parking garages. We have to take into consideration condenser discharge air recirculation. So, Sure, we've got 90 degrees entering it on a 90 degree day, but if we're raising that temperature 20, 30 degrees and it comes out, we recirculate it back in, now we're talking about being close to this 125 degrees. So think about your application and location of the unit. And always think about um, your clearances, uh, which can cause recirculation of condenser discharge air and think twice about installing these inside buildings or on top of a building, inside a building, uh, parking garages, things like that that can cause or exasperate this discharge air recirculation. All right, so kind of some of the common uh, 
things to think about as far as location. As far as line sets go, um, sizes are gonna be the same as what, we're, what we've had before. So all the liquid lines will be 3 eighths of an inch. Currently, I don't have any information on going smaller than 3 eighths of an inch on the liquid lines. Now, some of our units, we do let you go down to 5 sixteenths. Typically, those units are two and a half ton or smaller. They're also under 30 feet in length. Um, if you have an application to use smaller tubing on some of our other products, and I don't have that information yet on this specific product, uh, call TEC's tech support and we can guide you if in fact you can do that. Now, what I can tell you for a fact across the board with all residential equipment, carrier Brian Payne, is you can never go larger than three eighths of an inch uh, liquid pipe. So half inch, five eighths, absolutely not. What happens if you oversize your liquid line, we get into what we call refrigerant management issues, meaning that we have too much refrigerant in the system and it's harder for the unit and the condenser coil to manage that volume and it leads to uh, condenser coil header breakage, uh, compressor failures, things like that. So uh, three eighths is a maximum and for right now on this new unit uh, three eighths only until we find out more information about possibly going down to a five eighths liquid line for perhaps maybe the two ton or the, the three ton unit so stay tuned for that as far as suction pipe uh, sizes you can see your connection uh, um, diameters um, you can see your tube diameters so everything Pretty much standard here. Once we get the service manual out, we'll have the full tables that will give you uh, what sizes to use. As you've looked at other tables before, um, you know you could look at say the the four ton unit, and we're using the carrier models here for an example. But you can look at the four ton or the sixty ton or a five ton unit, and you know you could use seven eighths pipe on it. But in the charts. 7 8 pipe may carry you up to 80 feet without any capacity loss, but beyond 80 feet, we start getting into two, three, four percent capacity loss, and that's why we need to jump up to the inch and an eighth. So those charts are, you know, they're in the works, they're being reviewed, so we'll have those out when the service manual comes out to uh, give you more detail on what pipe size to use, okay? But one and an eighth inch, that will be your maximum uh, suction line size. Uh, on the three ton, four ton, and five ton units. You never go over an inch and an eighth. You never use inch and three eighths on any residential products, uh, condensing units. If you do, what happens is your suction gas velocities can slow down and we lose our oil entrainment ability. And if we start leaving the oil laying out in the system and not bring it back to the compressor, kind of self-explanatory on what can happen. Okay, so right now this is what we have on the piping charts. Um, some more footnotes here. There's no mufflers on these units, so there's no need to put a muffler on the suction line on any of these. Some of our uh, five-speed units, uh, some of you probably run into having to install mufflers uh, to reduce some of the gas pulsation in the suction line, but uh, all these have been tested and there is no uh, sound or vibration issues that they've noted, so. Uh, mufflers are not needed on this. And currently we're showing a max uh, equivalent length. Um, and again, this is equivalent length, not linear. So we're showing a max equivalent length of up to 250 uh, feet. Again, we'll have uh, some charts coming out when the service manuals hit and they'll tell you exactly what unit can go how many feet. But again, this is equivalent length so in other words, you have to add your elbows and fittings in here, all right? So let's say you've got a 50-foot linear length, but I've got, let's say, 10 elbows on it. And let's say each elbow is equivalent to two feet. So, you know, yes, I've got 50 feet of linear length, but you got to put the elbows in there. So I really have 60 feet of pipe. So just remember this is equivalent length. This is a, isn't a linear length of pipe. Now, typically in the service manuals, we will list linear and equivalent, but make sure you understand that right now, this is 250 feet of equivalent length, not linear, all right? And then vertical separation again, long line, uh, uh, our 
<clears throat> liquid line solenoid valves, you know, if we have more than a 20 foot elevation separation between uh, horizontal, I mean, uh, as far as uh, vertical separation of the condensing unit and the evaporator section. And then also, if we're greater than 80 feet, um, we have to look at uh, liquid line solenoid valves. So again, this will all be in the service manual, uh, when and where and what size unit that these things come in, uh, pipe length, uh, uh, <clears throat> um, line set sizes. So anyway, probably should stop there. Any questions on piping? Yes, we have one piping question from Jason uh, regarding the liquid line solenoid valve, asking if you can talk about how it wires. Um, there will be, so <clears throat> like on the five speed units, we have the AOC board. Um, this unit is going to ha have the same type of board. We're going to call it a PCM board, a primary control module. That's what it stands for. And there'll be two terminals on there that you wire your liquid line solenoid to, just like on the AOC boards of the five speed units. All right. We, that's the only piping question we had, but we did have an unrelated question from Joe a little while ago. Asking mm -hmm. if this unit can be used with a UVB furnace. With a UVB, that the UVB was Infinity. So yes, the Infinity controllers were are backward compatible on indoor equipment. The biggest thing is your user interface needs to be of the B series and the 3.0 software. So if a customer had a 58 UVB furnace or other older Infinity furnace. They could keep their furnace if they wanted to, upgrade their condensing unit to this one, possibly need to upgrade their thermostat depending on the vintage of their thermostat, but they could keep the furnace. Yes. Yeah. So you're and so I don't I can't rattle off all the Bryant numbers off the top of my head, but on the carrier side, if you had an MVC and MVB, um, you know, any any of the older uh furnaces, uh, of course the new MNs, the TNs, the uh, 987s, um, you know, those are all compatible, or of course the uh, FE fan coils. So yes, any Infinity Evolution Connects compatible uh, indoor unit, furnace or air cooler, will be compatible. And it's all, 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 all the control and everything will be through the, uh, uh, the user interface or the Infinity Evolution Controller. Okay, we got a few more that come in on the piping stuff here. Uh, Andrew asks, uh, are the long radius elbows adding more feet to the piping length? I'm long so radius. Go ahead. Yeah, long radius elbows will add less length to the equivalent piping length than short radius. So long radius is less than short radius as far as their equivalent lengths. And yes, yeah, so if you got a short radius 90 or short radius 45 or long radius 90, long radius um, or short radius 90 um, they all add to the equivalent length and there'll be a table uh, in the um, service manual for this showing you what the equivalent links are for those fittings all right uh, Tasso asks uh, I know we have over 20 feet of rise or length sometimes in those applications there's no well, I'm trying to I'm gonna read it exactly the way you wrote it and see if you get it I know we have over 20 feet of rise or length down sometimes. So in those applications, there's no way of using them, correct? I'm not sure what he's asking. He's asking if you can use the product if there's more than 20 feet of vertical separation. I think that's his question. Oh, 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 oh. okay, sure. That makes sense. So um, right now I'm betting on 20 foot vertical if the evaporator is above the condenser or heat pump, uh, 20 feet is going to be your max. And because we, you know, of course, we're, we're pumping liquid uphill, so that takes horsepower from the compressor. And on your lower speeds, that could be a challenge. Now, pumping liquid refrigerant downhill, if the evaporator is below the condenser or heat pump, that's another story. So I think that we'll see if the evaporator is below the condenser or heat pump, we'll be able to go more than 20 feet. But if, again, the evaporator is above the heat pump or condensing unit, we're probably going to be at 20 feet or less. So hopefully that answers that. All right. Uh, Steve asks, brazing versus soldering. I don't know if this is a general question or? Sure. 
So we haven't uh, permitted or recommended soldering ever actually. And brazing has always been required, especially since we've gone to R410 in the higher pressures. So yes, you should always be using braze. You should always be purging with nitrogen during the brazing process. And a 10 or 15% braze rod is what's recommended. And that's for all of our units, not just this new one. That's, that's for everything we sell from res to commercial. Yeah, the old, so that, that goes back a long time ago when you say solder. So we used to have what we called the soft solder. It came on a spool and before that, it, that was silver uh, silver bearing. And then before that it was 95.5, which is all a filler material and was considered soldering, which personally to me, soldering is when you're doing electronics, but people call that type of piping, uh, uh, joining that piping together as soldering as well. But no, we, we have to use braze. It's got to be brazed and always purge with nitrogen. And for those of you who are not familiar with the nitrogen purge, what you need to think about is when you're making a braze joint on a pipe, think about the discoloration and flake you get off that pipe on the outside of it after you're done. And you've all wiped off that braze with a cold, wet rag, and all of a sudden you can see the copper again, right? If you look at your rag, you've got all the black oxidation material. Well, that same exact oxidation occurs inside the pipe if you don't use a nitrogen purge. And now when the refrigerant travels through there, it washes all that braze flake off and it goes right into your TXVs, uh, components on the condensing unit, you know, your filter dryer, it goes all over and it plugs things up. So you absolutely need a nitrogen purge um, I think I may have some slides coming up on that. Um, but what you're doing with the nitrogen as you push it through all the piping prior to making any braze joints is you're pushing all the oxygen out of it. You've got to have oxygen present in order to oxidate it and get that, that what we call braze flake or that black flaking on there. So if we displace all the oxygen with the nitrogen, we don't have to worry about that occurring inside in the internal parts of the piping. So that, that's the whole purpose of it. So what you do is you run the, oxygen, you know, the, the nitrogen through your pipe to push all the oxygen out. <clears throat> and once you feel that you've purged all the piping, uh, you need to turn the pressure of that nitrogen down to almost zero, if you will. You don't want any kind of pressure inside the pipe pushing the braze material out of the joint. Um, but you just wanna make sure that we keep nitrogen in the pipe uh, in order to displace all the oxygen. So you have to braze and you absolutely have to use nitrogen purge. All right, we got several more here if you're game. Uh, yeah. Andrew asks, should we add a pump down pump out to a long liquid line set? A pump down pump to a long liquid line set. Um, so, uh, let me answer it this way. Um, once the system is brazed together and sealed, uh, we do have to pump it down into a vacuum. You can do a triple evacuation method, um, or just single, uh, pump down. We got to get down to 500 micron and I'll go through the chart, but we need to hold at 500 micron, um, you know, if we see that rising up higher than a thousand micron, then we still got a wet system. If it's above a thousand, two thousand micron, then we've got a leak somewhere. And I'll show you the chart later on. But we absolutely have to pull this down into a vacuum down to 500 micron to assure we've got a sealed and dry system. Um, if he perhaps may be a commercial um, tech. Um, if you're talking about a pump out system like we use on a centrifugal chiller where we would be able to pump all the refrigerant out of the system into a holding tank, no. We never do anything like that on any type of uh, high pressure refrigerant systems, residential or commercial. All right, Chris, at, Chris asks, where should the liquid line solenoid be, be installed, by the coil or the condenser? Uh, depends on if it's a heat pump or if it's a condensing unit. If it's a condensing unit AC only, we put it in by the evaporator. If it's a heat pump, then we put it outdoors at the outdoor uh, unit. And then I, I've got slides coming up that I'll show you that location. 
So everything is the same on this as, as before. And, and again, on the AC, we put it by the evaporator coil because we're worried about stopping the migration, I'm assuming, of refrigerant flowing through naturally because of the height? Well, it's all about stopping migration, but it's also about efficiency. So we put it, um, we, we put it in by the evaporator for cooling because we're building a head of liquid uh, in that liquid line. So um, not only does it stop migration, but as soon as that unit calls for the next cooling cycle, that liquid line but solenoid valve opens, instantly we've got liquid right there at the, evap at the evaporator's TXV um, to start feeding. So we instantly start operating, where if you don't have a liquid line solenoid valve, one, it takes a little while to develop the liquid at the TXV, at the metering device. So there's an efficiency story there to talk about on liquid line solenoid valves. And then, yes, the biggest uh, thing is being uh, protective in preventing off-cycle uh, migration of the refrigerant and flooded starts on the compressor. All right, then the reverse question is on the heat pump, why are we not putting it at the evaporator in that case? Obviously the evaporator could be either coil, so we picked the outdoor unit as my evaporator in the heat mode. <laughs> Why do we not care about the cooling mode evaporator indoors then? Typically on the heat pumps, we have a HSO biflow TXV. So in other words, a hard shutoff biflow TXV. And typically on the heat pumps, in many cases, with the exception of this one, the metering device outdoors for the coil when you're in the heating mode was a fixed metering device. It wasn't a uh, hard shutoff style TXV or in the case of this unit, an EXV or electronic expansion valve. So um, that, that, that was the main reason for the LLSs to be outside next to the heat pump versus inside near the evaporator coil. All right, we got two questions from Andrew and Ferris that sound like they're related, both regarding buried line sets. So I'll give them to you both together. Uh, Andrew asks, uh, on buried line sets, it'll affect the subcooling charging. What's the adjustment to the charge as per the link? And Ferris's question is, how about underground line set, set run? Is that ex exactable? I don't know what exactable means. Acceptable. Maybe that's so that's, an, that's mm -hmm. an easy answer. I'll give you three answers. No, no, and no. Okay. We don't permit buried line sets on any of our equipment residentially nor do we allow it commercially. So no buried line sets, uh, period. It will tell you in the caution boxes in the beginning of every installation piece we have, do not bury the line sets. Now what happens to when you do that is in this case of this unit, you lose control of subcooling uh, because the liquid is so subcooled, number one. But moreover, the most important thing affecting all equipment is we bring the suction line temperature down lower than what the condensing unit is and typically what the evaporator is seeing uh, on the off cycle. So what happens is you get all this liquid migration into the coldest point as refrigerant always seeks the coldest point, lowest pressure point, right? So you have all this liquid migrating to this buried piping and now the unit starts up with a suction line full of liquid. And needless to say, that doesn't uh, bode well with the compressor, it's lubrication or compression. So you just simply can't bury piping on any of our equipment. Okay. Uh, Joe asks about oil traps in the suction line with over 20 feet higher elevation on the condensing unit. Um, so no oil traps. Um, it's a good question, Joe. Um, no oil traps, but when the evaporator is above the condensing unit at heat pump, we always do an inverted trap on the suction line. So in other words, we bring our suction line up to or slightly above the very top of the evaporator coil. But no P traps, J traps anywhere else in the system um, in a vertical separation, only an inverted when the evaporator is above. So if your evaporator is below, there are no traps anywhere or there shouldn't be any traps anywhere. All right, Jim has a follow-up question to the buried line set. He's asking, with the buried line set, if they already have that at their job, they cannot have a VNA system, correct? If they have a buried line set at the job, you can't have any system is, is what the answer is. 
Um, and I know there's a gym. I know there's a lot out there. There are a lot of condo complexes, apartment complexes that have varied line sets. But it's been proven by all manufacturers. It just it shortens the life of the compressors. It just destroys them. Um, people ask about adding accumulators and receivers, and then we get right back into that same scenario of having an oversized liquid line. We get into a refrigerant management issue, um, you know, causing you know flood back. Uh, you know, if your your condenser coil is is logged with refrigerant because of the excessive you know charge or issues that occur. Uh, you know, you can have header breakage, all kinds of things. So, um, no, it doesn't. It doesn't matter what it is, even if it's a stripped down single stage um, AC unit. You can't bury the lines. All, all manufacturers. There are people out there that you know are saying, well, you can do it on this manufacturer's product or this manufacturer's product. But if you actually read the manufacturer's product, everybody's stating the same thing, which is no more than 36 inches of pipe underground. And it's not 36 inches deep, it's 36 inches of a length. Now that's the maximum, which isn't very much. So if a little bit gets covered up outside, we're okay, but you can't, as the phrase says, you, you know, you, you can't bury the line set, period. Um, there are white papers out there, not by the manufacturers, that say if you dig a trench and add pea gravel and put in a six inch PVC pipe and run your refrigerant pipe through that, that that's acceptable. That is not true. Uh, manufacturers don't support that. that. That's old, old stuff from commercial that people try to adapt to residential. So the buried line set, I can't, I, I, I can't uh, express that more than no more than I just did, I don't think. And, and if you have buried lines and you start losing compressors, it, it doesn't matter if the unit's three months old, if you're losing compressors, it's not gonna be covered by warranty, it will be rejected. So you just don't wanna do that. If you've got an existing site like that, you really start needing, you need to, you really start, you, you need to look for a, it, alternate routing or something you got to you got to come up with something um you know, especially with these variable speed products so all right there's a whole bunch more questions about buried line sets i am not going to read all your guys buried line set questions because doug's going to keep repeating the same answer which is no so <laughs> um all the little workarounds you guys are sending me i'm not going to even read them right now because it's not going to get me anywhere different but i right. do, do two more That's questions why Doug, and then I'll get you. i'm sorry That's why i went through the detail ryan of yeah. of there's conversation out there of, 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 you know, burying the PVC pipe, leaving one end open, putting an accumulator on, crankcase heater, all these little uh, peripheral components. And, and no, none of it works reliably. None of it is acceptable. And I challenge you to find any manufacturer, especially the veritable capacity products that allows it. They just, they just don't. Nobody does because it's, look guys, it's physics. It's refrigerant changing state from temperatures and pressures generated by the compressor, period. It's all physics. Uh, migration takes place and that's where it goes to the coldest point, which is your buried pipe. And that compressor is like sticking a, you know, is it, like sticking a straw on a glass of refrigerant, you know, a jug of refrigerant, sucking up the liquid right into the suction port. It's gonna ruin it. You flood back, you wash the oil from the bearings, you can't compress liquid. All these things end up in destroying or failing the compressor. So there's, there, there isn't any device out there that makes this permittable or makes it better. There isn't any type of pipe routing, uh, type of enclosures, none of it. You just can't do it. And that takes me back to my original answer. No, no, and no. All right, I just said I wasn't gonna read anymore, but I am gonna read this one because I actually wanna know the answer. If I have a house on slab with a line set in the concrete, is that considered buried line set like you've been describing? Um, that is considered buried. I am aware of some jobs. So if you think about a slab home with perimeter loop ducting in the slab, I've seen where people have drilled a hole in the side of the slab and penetrated the ductwork that's encased within the slab. 
and ran the pipe through one of the supply runs back to the furnace that's in the center of the home. And then up. And the problem there is now your liquid and suction line, not only is it seeing ground temperature, in many cases it could be seen less than normal ground temperature of 50 to 60 degrees because it's in the supply uh, stream, supply air stream. So it's just as bad as burying it. So you'll have the same result. You know, definitely not. You can't use the duct run in a slab. Um, I've never seen refrigerant pipe actually encased in and by itself in a slab. Typically, it's under the slab. So again, no, but um, you know, thanks for pointing that out. Um, but no, can't can't do it. All again, right. if you do these things, you you're going to lose your warranty. You may get away with one compressor, but when the second compressor comes through the warranty system, it automatically gets flagged. And once it gets flagged, now the site's got to be investigated on why we're losing so many compressors. And as soon as we see that, then unfortunately, all warranty is removed from the uh, system. And that never turns out well. All right, Doug. Uh, what it, Jasper's asking, what is your opinion on using AC Renew for noise, efficiency, and longer life? Um, so I wouldn't recommend putting it in a new unit, um, especially uh, these veritable speed units. Um, you know, we're getting in some different oils. So the factory isn't approving it. I'm not aware of any of the other major manufacturers approving it at this time. Um, with that said, I haven't heard anything out there on it causing failure um, but I don't know that it's actually going to truly improve any efficiencies on this newer style equipment. Older units um, you know things get a little uh, waxed up and gummed up inside I can see where it can help there um, but uh, no I, I wouldn't recommend um, nor is it approved for the, the newer systems. All right, uh, Andrew asks, if you're gonna install the heat pump version of this unit, but you don't plan on using it in the heating mode, you're just gonna use it as a straight AC, maybe you don't, uh -huh. for whatever reason, uh, do we use a single direction filter dryer? No. No, I would still put the bi-flow in. It comes with the unit. The, the, the filter dryer shifts with the unit, so I would use it. Um, just in case the next homers, homeowner moves in there and says, wow, I got a heat pump. So they start using it in heat pump mode. Now all of a sudden the filter dryer comes apart and you now they got big problems. Yeah, plus if it's coming with it, you already paid for it, you already have it in your hand, so you're good to go. Right. I know it came with it at the time. Um, yeah, it does ship with the unit. The, the, the liquid line filter dryer ships with, and so does that five inch three eighths uh, stub. Uh, Steve asks, um, you said the 25 VNA4 heat pump is good down to negative 15 degrees. What were the previous models, 25 VNA8 and 25 VNA0? Uh, they go down about zero. You can still get some appreciable heat out at zero, but um, being a heat, pump, you know, a heat pump fan that I am, I've had several of them in my house. I've had the five speed. I've had the VNA0. I've had the two speeds. Um, I, any, any time a new product comes out and just like this one, I'll put it in my house just so I can watch it, see how it performs. Uh, what I can tell you is yes, you're producing heat with no problem and it will start and run at these temperatures. So it's one thing to say that a unit will run down to zero or run down to 15 minus 15 degrees. It's a completely different conversation to stay, say that that product will start at zero or it will start at minus 15. In the case of this product, it's been proven, you know, we've proved it, they've tested it, and it will start at minus 15, it will cycle. Uh, what I can also tell you on heat pumps and having the variable speeds and single speed heat pumps is once you start getting down to about 10 degrees or below, typically you're either gonna need um, some assist which would be putting it on a VNA, say a VNA4. So now I've got an air handler with electric heat strips in it. So what happens, the heat pump keeps running and running. And then as we get down to these lower temperatures, we bring in the electric heat to operate with the heat pump, which is called an assist system, okay? 
The other option is if you have gas heat in it. Now that's called a backup system. And then you have a thermal balance point or an efficiency balance point you look at. And so, hey, what outdoor temperature, is it more efficient to operate the furnace at versus the heat pump? And what kind of quality of air temperature am I gonna get out of it? Meaning the discharge supply grills. So there's a lot to it. Um, setting up heat pumps, typically I think you'll find changeover temperatures or introduction into assist temperatures at around 15 degrees plus Fahrenheit or lower. Um, at about 15 degrees, typically you're getting discharge air temperatures in the mid to high 80s. Um, so, you know, some people perceive that as not warm enough heat to heat the space, heat the home, you know, although you're maintaining set points. So a lot of conversation on that, uh, on the temperature and the minus 15. But what we're saying there is, hey, this thing will start at minus 15, uh, will produce heat at minus 15. All right. Uh, Ferris asks, how about a solenoid valve with pump down system? No, no, we don't do pump down. There's no reason to do pump down, um, but we don't do any pump down as a regular cycle um, <clears throat> on any of our residential units. Okay, getting into more of a um, process application there. Now, with that said, the way these units are set up, when you get into these VNAs, um, and even uh, you know the five speeds and the two speeds, they have an automatic pump down cycle in them that can be activated through your user interface. So if for some reason you need to service the evaporator, or you got a clog TXD, whatever the case may be, and actually, through your user interface, meaning the Infinity Controller or Evolution Controller, you can go in there and go into pump down evacuation mode, and it will pump all the uh, refrigerant, you know, out to the outdoor unit using the solenoid valves within the unit, uh, and it's a heat pump, the EXVs. So um, that's what I can tell you about that. So it's kind of it's, it's available on this, but it's when I say it's available, it's available for a service function. It's not an every cycle pump out or pump down. Uh, Sergio asks, uh, how about adding smart seal after insula installation? Would it hurt the system? Uh, I am not familiar with its use. And if you follow the installation, um, uh, the installation procedures, you know, we're going to braze everything closed. Um, if we're going to evacuate down to 500 micron, make sure we got a tight sealed system, a moisture free system, and you shouldn't have to use that product. Um, on this unit, especially, or any other variable speed units, especially, I would really recommend against it. And the reason why is all these units have electronic expansion valves in them, which I'll get into more detail later. And it's possible that that stuff could gum these things up. So I, I don't recommend using any type of a, if, I, if I'm hearing you right, Smart Seal, I believe, is a, a sealing agent to help with leaks in the system. So, but I would not recommend using it. And by the way, you guys got some great questions today. <laughs> uh, Back to the uh, low temperature heating, Jim asks, will the unit automatically shut off at negative 20 degrees to protect the system? Um, there is some lockout temperatures we'll get into, yes. All right. That's more on the service part, Jim. And we're gonna get into all that detail that, um, well, it'll definitely be tomorrow now, um, but we're gonna get into all that detail if you could hang in there till tomorrow. But yes, we've got some lockout temperatures. Uh, Wayne asks, is there a chart on BTU output? I'm assuming that was typed in at the time we were talking about low ambient heating. Um, as far as how many, if you're asking how many BTUs that you know we get, uh, let's say we got a five ton heat pump, 
you know, how many BTUs are we getting at uh, 20 degrees, 10 degrees, zero, minus 10, minus 15. Right. I have not seen a chart on that yet, but like I say, we've got the literature, the service manual, um, product data, install books. Those are all currently in the review stage and will be released soon. Um, and then I'll have answers. Uh, I'll have those type of answers for you. But right now, I'm not sure if they're going to produce that yet yeah. and what book it'll be in. And the unit that this is superseding, the 25 VNA0, that book has those charts. So presumably this one would likely have it as well. Yeah, yeah I would think so. I just, I'm not sure where it's going to land, if it's going to land in the PD yeah. or if it'll also be in the install book. But um, we'll, we'll know within a couple of weeks here. It's it's in the final stage of the review. All right. Uh, Sergio asks, uh, when the heat pump is in defrost mode, does the indoor fan continue to run producing cooling for a period of time? I would think it would have to. That's the whole point of defrost mode, I think. I think he must mean the right. outdoor fan. I don't know. Well, when you're in defrost, any heat pump that goes into defrost, right. essentially you're operating in it in the cooling mode, and we stop the condenser fan outside. Right. Correct. Drive heat pressure up. So we have to run the indoor fan because that's where we're getting the heat from to defrost the coil. Right. Yep. It, exactly. Yeah, we run the indoor fan, and in some cases, uh, we can also do uh, heating. You know, uh, heating assist during defrost. So depending on how you set everything up, especially on fan coils, you can actually run heating during defrost. All right, uh, Ferris asks, is it okay to add seal into the system to seal any possible leaks in the system? I think we already asked um, that. Yeah, we, we, I, I'm assuming that you heard the answer on the last one, uh, but but no, let's not do that. Um, let's just make sure our braze joints are good, everything's sealed, we get the proper uh, uh, vacuum on it, 500 micron or less. And again, there's too many components within the refrigerant, the sealed refrigerant system, like EXVs, um, that this stuff could possibly plug up, and that just becomes an absolute nightmare to troubleshoot and to correct. So I would, I'm going to say no. Let's not use that any type of sealer in there. All right, Brian asks. Um, you said the max temperature for heat pump is 66 degrees ambient. What happens if their customer tries to run their heat pump when it's warmer than that outside? Uh, head pressure trips. It'll go into a fault, and it will be broadcast on the user interface and out at the unit. All right, Doug, we are all caught up on questions, so I'm going to let you get back to the slides here. All right, well, great questions. Yeah, a lot of good ones. We're, uh, where in the heck were we here? So pipe sizing, all right? So I think we're we're out of there. Um, let's get rid of this guy. Okay. There we go. Back in business. Uh, let me see. All right. This was just, uh, I think we covered all this, so we can go by this. Again, just to reiterate, don't forget to use nitrogen when you purge. Got to do it. All right. There we go. Um, just to add additionally, so something we should be doing on all equipment, um, you know, as we're in, and the best time to do it is when you're pulling a vacuum on it. You know, you've got everything else uh, brazed in, you know, you get your wall penetration sealed up, you know, you're checking everything out. And why this thing's on the vacuum pump, you know, always take a look because you're going to have the cover off the machine, right? So always just take a look around and make sure that nothing shifted in piping, just kind of take a quick inspection of all the piping within the unit. Make sure, you know, during shipment, because shipment, especially into the Midwest area with all of our wonderful roads, uh, they, these units just get beat to heck. So, uh, you know, see if there's any pipes touching there that could possibly rub and separate those out. Um, we've got pictures coming up. You'll see that there's a lot of piping um, inside these guys, especially on the heat pumps and then on the five ton with the uh, brace plate heat exchanger. So, um, just take a quick look at all piping um, on any of this equipment, including rooftops for that matter. Just kind of take an overall look. It is truly part of startup. We should always check wire connections, you know, Molex plug connections, spade connectors, check everything, make sure everything's tight and is uh, secured as, as designed. So it's like I say, shipping just really plays a toll on the, uh, the equipment. 
And in the beginning, uh, I showed you the packaging, the change the package with the speed clips and stuff to take the boxes apart. But the boxes also have a new styrofoam base in them that uh, is absorbing some of the shock and shipping. So hopefully some of that kind of damage uh, will we'll see go away. So, that, um, But anything's possible. Anything's possible while they're being trucked. And I think we beat this up uh, in conversation with questions on the vacuum. So uh, unless there are any questions on it, we'll move past that. And this chart is an old chart. This has been in all of our equipment and the service manuals for a long time. So when pulling a vacuum, you know, again, black line, you're pulling a vacuum. We want to get down to 500 micron and then shut the unit off. And as long as that doesn't rise back above a thousand micron, we've got a good tight sealed system. But if we see, and here's your minute duration down here, if we pull a vac vacuum down to 500 micron, and we see this thing rising above a thousand micron, then we still possibly have moisture in the piping, moisture in the system. Uh, there's something going on here. And if it rises up any more than that, then we, we got a leak somewhere. So use your micron gauge, um, you know, to really tell you what's going on. If you don't have one, you really need to get one. Nowadays, equipment is so sensitive with TXVs, EXVs, pressure transducers, all these different components. Um, you know, we really need to make sure the system is tight and absent of any uh, any kind of moisture. So, you know, if you don't have a vacuum gauge, you know you know, please go out and get one. They make them in all different price ranges and, and even some of the cheap ones, you know, they, they do a good job as long as you take care of them. So wiring and electrical, um, let's talk about that a little bit. We'll get into some of the control wiring as well. And, and Ryan, I, we had a lot of questions. How are we doing on time? I haven't looked at time here. Uh, it's 310. Yeah, we got about what, 20 minutes here. So yeah, um, Ish. all right, so, so, uh, Wiring and electrical, um, <clears throat> again, the power wiring to these, you know, you, you got to really, you got to run a ground. So you need your L1, your L2, and you need ground. Um, if you don't have ground, you're going to have to drive a ground rod outside and chassis ground it to the unit. Um, if not, you could have some issues. One, it's a safety factor. But two, you could have uh, some issues with communication. Um, if you're trying to run a two wire or if you have a two wire only available and we all know there are many homes out there with some of this wire that is buried in the wall and it was a two wire from uh, the older installations. So, um, you know, uh, 208, 230 volt, you need to be somewhere around there. Uh, we don't want to be over 254 volts. You get above that, you get into problems um, both on the primary side and the secondary side. These units are so smart. They monitor their voltage now. They monitor primary voltage. In other words, your power supply to the unit. They monitor control voltage. In other words, your 24 volt AC voltage. They're monitoring the five volt DC voltage to the transducers. It's uh, monitoring your DC output bus off the inverter to the compressors. So these units are really smart. And if you give them some kind of a for uh, power supply or connections, it's going to know it and it's going to tell you. So make sure you get proper power to these units and it's properly grounded. Um, again, control wiring, yes, we can use a two wire if you have proper ground. If not, you're going to need that third wire or, like I just said, a grounding rod <clears throat> and chassis grounding the outdoor unit. Okay, I'll get more into the control wiring, I think, in a slide or two here. Or how about now? All right, so again, uh, A and B, you have to have, possibly you need a fourth wire. Um, you could use shielded cable. If you're under 100 feet, uh, 18 gauge. If you're over 100 feet with infinity control and this unit, you need to go to 16 gauge. Um, if you have several units on a job and you start having some electrical interference issues, um, you may need a 100 ohm end of the line resistor. Um, and we can help you in tech support if you run into that. And what you'll have is some uh, communication error kind of problems. So, you know, you say, hey, look, we wire the unit right, it's grounded. 
Um, I've got my two wire in here, um, but yet I'm still getting communication problems. Um, that can happen if you got multiple units, especially if you're uh, bringing all these wires back in one area. Um, so there's what's called an end of the line resistors, 100 ohm resistors you can put in there to kind of smooth that out and slow the speed of the communication down just a little bit enough to, to get away from that problem. So, um, but 100 foot, 18 gauge above that 16 gauge, and that goes for any infinity wiring. And just uh, uh, a few more things, make sure that your uh, control wire is separated from any power wiring. If you do encounter power wiring with your two wire control wiring, it should cross that power wiring perpendicular. Don't run it parallel with it. So in other words, don't zip tie your control wire to your power wire or conduits. You need to kind of, you know, like I say, cross them perpendicular. Uh, so in other words, it's minimal contact uh, with line voltage uh, type wiring or any uh, comm trunks also in uh, IT rooms. So think about all that. And runs greater than 200 feet, consult the wall control. And if you do that, they talk to about 16 gauge wire, um, end of the line resistors, things like that, okay? And everything I just said is kind of right here. Jumped ahead on you. So any, any questions on uh, control or line voltage wire? Uh, John asks, is shielded cable a requirement or a suggestion? Uh, it's not a requirement. You can use that. Um, and that's indicated right here. If you use shielded cable, ground the shield at chassis ground or common at the furnace or fan coil only. Don't ever ground shield a cable on both sides. It creates a loop that can cause all kinds of other issues, interference, acts like an antenna. So you can use shielded wire if you think it's necessary um, and then ground it at the furnace or fan coil on chassis ground, terminal, or common. I would add that improperly grounded shields is worse than not using shielded cable at all. That's correct. That is correct. Um, Sergio was asking if there was a way to minimize the runtime on the indoor fan during the defrost mode to minimize cold blow complaints. That's all adjustable at the at the uh, user interface. And I, I will add that you have to run the indoor fan in order to defrost the outdoor coil. So really. And, and with the inverter units, they're doing it based on sensors, not like old school timers. So it's only going to run a defrost when it really has to. It's not a random timer. Well, it's after, you're, after you exit defrost and you go back into a heating mode, and it depends on what you're doing. So if you have fossil fuel backup and you exit defrost, it's going to change over to the fossil fuel to finish out that heating cycle. Huh. Um, if you're on an FE fan coil, you can get some run time, and that's the post defrost run time. So there, there is some adjustments uh, in the infinity control, um, just like there's uh, um, um, adjustments on uh, end of cooling cycle uh, fan run time, where you can eliminate that or take it down to like five seconds instead of the 60 or 90 seconds, which um, basically what that one is for is to keep the, uh, uh, the condensation from re-evaporating into the space and re-raising your humidity levels. So there are some, some adjustments depending on what your indoor unit is. All right. Thank you, Doug. You bet. All right. And then airflow setup. Well, first of all, the only thing that uh, these units are going to be compatible with is a communicating indoor unit. So with communicating indoor unit and the infinity or evolution control, you've already got uh, your um, CFM setup um, that takes place and we confirm airflow, of course, uh, during the uh, setup of the equipment. So tomorrow we'll talk more about specifics as far as the setups and how we do it, as well as how we do the setups outside from uh, an app on your phone via the uh, uh, Bluetooth module in the unit. So, but basically, um, the evolution controller, infinity controller, 
um, it's automatically going to select airflow, you know, based on the equipment size. So it's going to go out and it's going to recognize the furnace and then or the air handler. It'll go out and recognize the new 26 or 24 uh, SEER unit. And then it'll automatically set up your airflow for you uh, at 350 CFM a ton. Now, if you want to modify that and take it to nominal or whatever you want to do, a nominal of 400 a ton, um, that can all be done via the um, uh, control setups, the uh, uh, user interface or the Bluetooth setup. So, and that's where you adjust between, as you see here, between comfort, efficiency, and max airflow. So, all stuff are adjustable. Uh, the dip switches, uh, as far as the dip switches on the furnace board, uh, not necessary. Um, you can do it at the infinity control, or we can do it through the Bluetooth module. So, um, a lot of adjustability and also know that the infinity controller always always overrides the dip switch settings not the other way around so um, a lot of adjustability with air but know that it is automatically selected um, as you set the unit up and the unit is recognized <clears throat> so commissioning and charging um, so these like all of our other units and where are we at on time? So I know how far to go here. Okay, we've got nine minutes. Um, so weigh-in really is the only way to charge the, any variable speed product. And it's the simplest, the quickest, and most accurate. So with this particular unit being an Infinity Evolution unit, um, you can use in the controller, the wall controller, to actually determine the amount of weigh-in charge. Now, the wall controller, if you've ever used it, or if you haven't, what it will do, because it automatically recognizes the tonnage of the outdoor unit, um, it will know what its shipment charge was. So the unit was shipped to work on 15 feet of 3 8 tube liquid line, line sets. It will also ask you about the evaporator coil and it knows if there's any additional charges needed for the evaporator coil, which is typically like 0 0.2, 0 0.1, you know, ounces. So it's not much, uh, if any at all. So it will know all that. And then it's gonna ask you the tube size. It'll ask you the link size. And it's doing all the calculation for you. And then ultimately it will come up and say, hey, you know what, you need to add this much refrigerant or you need to remove this much refrigerant. And you do it all by weight. Um, to try to charge these by um, subcooling method, which is what you're going to be doing, because we're talking TXV, both ends of it, if it's a heat pump, but TXV on um, the evaporator, if it's cooling, um, you're going to be using a subcooling method. But I tell you, it, it's I, nowadays, I don't know why we would even want to spend the time on that. Um, checking subcooling would be for service work and troubleshooting, not for initial charge and uh, startup. So, what the controller is doing when it calculates that weigh in charge is it says, okay, you got a three ton unit. Um, we know it's got uh, seven pounds of refrigerant in it that's good for 15 feet of line. And then it's taking the calculation. So you got 15 feet of line, but you set, you're, let's say you got a charge for 15 feet of line, but I've actually got 25 feet of pipe on it. So, okay, so now you take that extra 10 feet, you multiply it by 0.6 ounces, and um, your 0.6 pounds, I mean, and, and there you go, there's your weigh-in charge. Or if you're under 15 feet, you have to subtract the charge out by foot. So that's all it's doing on the, uh, on the um, user interface is doing that calculation for you. So and again, we'll get in more to that. We'll get, we'll get in deeper tomorrow and uh, I'll show you how that all works. And we can work out some of the problems if you want. But weigh-in is the way to do it. Don't Don't mess around trying to uh, charge used by subcooling method. It just uh, the time it takes. It just doesn't make sense now with the with with the information and the precise charging we're getting now out of the factory. So that's what's going on there. Um, why don't we stop there and we'll use the remaining time for some questions if there is any before we get into the software and components. Which, by the way, this is the uh, um, electrical panel of the unit now. You can see the uh, VFD and down here the PCM module, which used to be called the AOC. So any, any questions? 
Uh, we do have a few more that came in. Uh, so Steve asks, and this may be just a general question not related to this specific unit, but uh, if I had my vac pump inadvertently run for a long time, say a few hours because I got sidetracked, is it possible that it could begin to suck refrigerant out of the still, still sealed closed unit? I found some ACs that seemed like they were low on refrigerant and made me wonder. Well, and you know, it's a good question, a good observation. And this is why we say when you braze the pipe onto the liquid service valve and the suction service valve, make sure you keep those service valves fully quenched with a wet rag and some heat block or whatever it takes. Because if you melt those nylon seals in there, you can get refrigerant escapement past it. Now, if the nylon seals haven't been damaged from overheating and the valves remain, you remain in the lockdown position, no, you're, you're not going to um, suck the refrigerant past that. But typically that's done, uh, that does happen. I've, I've heard this many times before and it, it's, it's due to damaged valves, leaky valves. Um, Tasso asks, uh, here in the city, he has some areas that he works in that have too high a voltage from the power company. Uh, mm -hmm. the electricians look at it. Their electricians tell them that the power company is the problem, which obviously never gets fixed. Is there any uh, fix that they can do for high voltage situations? Uh, that's a tough one. We deal with that all over commercial and res equipment and you know, it was, so there, there are electrical parameters that weren't a big deal back in the day when we had a contactor and a capacitor in the unit. Nowadays, with all the electronics, um, you got to rectify it one way or another. You could try, um, you know, there, there are some devices you can try out there, some transformers, things like that. But really, if Comet or wherever you're at, I'm assuming it's the city means Chicago, so, so ComEd, if they're delivering over 253 volts on a 230 volt, 240 volt system, whatever you want to call it, they, they need to correct that. You know, if they're, they're pushing out, you know, you know, two, 260 or something like that, they got to correct it. They know that's not right. So I, I wouldn't take that for an answer if they say there's nothing wrong with it. Um, it's just like the higher voltages, um, you know, the four, 460 volt stuff, you know what, we can go to 480 volt stuff, but still 504 is the max. If you're over that, they have a problem with their transformer and they either need to change a tap on it or look to see what's going on on the transformer. But other than that, there's just not much you can do um, due to over voltage situations or under voltage situations for that matter. All right, Horace asks, do you have to add fittings in the liquid line for equivalent line run for calculating the charge? Yes, and when the service manual uh, comes out here in the next couple of weeks, um, it will show you your long radius, short radius 90s, as well as the 45s and their equivalent length that you add into the linear length of pipe. And then there'll be a chart also for, uh, you know, what size pipe you need to run on the suction side. All right, Fares asks, uh, for the evaporator coils, are they multi-position or is there a dedicated position for up, down, and horizontal? We've got, uh, we've got several different coils. We have horizontal coils. We've got some dedicated and we have uh, upflow, downflow. So um, none of those are necessarily specific to this unit. Uh, but yes, we have we we've got a couple that are upflow downflow, um, and then we have dedicated horizontals. So there's we we've got a variety cased uncased. So hopefully that answers the question. Yeah, I don't I don't think we have any coils that are both vertical and horizontal. I don't think. It's, no, not vertical and horizontal. Yeah. Nope. So we either have vertical, which means you can use it up or down, and then we have horizontal. And that's Correct. the main categories of discussion there. Yep. All right. uh, Sergio has a nice weird one. He must have thought about this one for a while. But if a little mouse or animal gets inside the electrical compartment and ruins the control board, is that covered under warranty? Um, is it a gray mouse or the white and tan ones? <laughs> it, it probably does matter, huh? <laughs> Next. <laughs> uh, Bears has a good one. Can this unit work on a backup generator? 
with some of them have dirty power. I would think a generator would have cleaner power, but I'm not sure what he means there. Let's no, it's actually, it's actually a very good question. Um, and we ran into this years ago when we came out with the variable speed furnaces and it's hit or miss. I've seen a lot of the variable speed furnaces not behave well on a generator. And I think you're gonna get the same result on any of these uh, electronically driven um, condensing units or heat pumps. So uh, it, it, that, that, that's a tough one. You, you could have problems is all I'll say. Uh, John says, the inverter looks much different than the old ones. Are we still going to have a 15 minute wait time for capacitor discharge? I do not see those capacitors on this new inverter. Yeah, yes, this isn't the best uh, picture. Um, the, there will be, um, if you follow my cursor, there will be a little red LED there that looks like that. And when you disable power, wait for that LED to extinguish, which will tell you that capacitors are bled down. After that LED extinguishes, I'd wait one more minute. So this total wait time is gonna be about five minutes, maybe seven minutes at most. And that should be the same as the old MOC uh, board on the uh, older units. So that this is an inverter. So it will have the capacitors on there. And that's what's underneath that shield right there. All right, I think we are all caught up on questions. Um, so, and we're also at 3.30, so that's good timing. Um, okay. You guys probably should all know when you signed up, it's a two day thing. So tomorrow, Friday at two o'clock, uh, we'll be picking up from that point on. Um, if you have someone else in your office that wants to join in, that's fine. I, in a couple hours, I'm gonna post the recording of this one today on our website, tcmongo.com slash training. So I would have them watch that first before they join us at two o'clock tomorrow so they're not lost. Um, but other than that, we will see you guys tomorrow. Or we won't see All you. Right. We'll and real, okay. real quick, Ryan, yes. not to interrupt. No, no. Uh, but real quick, guys, tomorrow what we're gonna do is we're gonna go through the apps, the phone apps, um, how to set it up, how to use it. We'll get into more of the equipment uh, components, talk about all these components. So just so you can see a little preview um, this will be uh, tomorrow. So we'll go through all this. We'll go through a mocked up uh, service call and how you would address it from your phone app. So uh, it, it's pretty cool. I think you'll like it. Again, no gauges, no meters. You don't need a VOM or a gauge to set this up or check it out. So that's what uh, tomorrow will be uh, be all about. We'll get into the refrigerant cycle of the uh, uh, grace plate heat exchanger as well. So I hope to see everybody tomorrow. Awesome. All right. Thank you, guys. Thanks, Doug. You bet. Take care.